Ah, uh -huh, good morning. So this uh, Association of Psychology or whatever, the APA uh, Boys and Men Practice Guidelines, the uh, outline of how they should look at and treat their various clients and customers that come into them for, for psychological help, really breaks down into uh, well justification of every excess of personal behavior that we make fun of. This may bore the shit out of you, but I, I can't stand it. I'm sitting here reading this stuff, and I'm seeing. And last night I posted a video. There's a part in there's a there's an episode of South Park where the little girls begin to get boobs. One of them gets a boob job, and every time they walk onto the playground or they look at one boy, all the boys go oh, 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 start start regressing to this primal image of uh, of boys. And good morning. And uh, and I see that same kind of response with regards to this to this report. Everybody said, "Oh, it's toxic masculinity," and everybody flies off the handle. I doubt if anybody's really even read the thing. Maybe a couple of people, but not most of them. <laughs> they just see something. Oh, I'm going to share that because I, I I'm going to. Oh gosh, I'm going to let people know what I really think. That's not masculinity. Hmm. So I'm going to read some of these, and I'm going to offer some opinions. And um, probably have a good laugh out of it all. But uh, like I said, I'm still waking up. It's kind of a cloudy day. But if we get to it, I'll answer a couple of questions as well. The, um, let me start here real simple. This Because they, they go through, and the first thing they do is they define all of these roles, all of these ideas. They... Uh, they uh, they preface the entire report with uh, ideas of uh, gender. That's the psychological, social, and cultural experiences and characteristics associated with the social statuses of girls, women, boys, men. Whereas sex refers to biological aspects. So gender includes assumptions, social beliefs, norms, and stereotypes. About... So they're giving them an out right there. But you can be whatever you want to be. Okay. Cisgender. is used to refer to people whose sex assigned at birth is aligned with their gender identity. I don't understand that. That just is stupid to me. Gender bias. Um, that males and females may contain significant distortions and inaccuracies. So if girls want to hang out with girls and boys want to hang out with girls, there are, and boys want to hang out with boys, there may be something wrong with that. They've already vilified the very basic aspect of who and what we are and how we do things. Gender role strain. A psychological situation which gender role demands have negative consequences on the individuals or others. Mental. Ah, yeah. That's when you decide that you're a boy and you decide you want to be a girl. There's gender role strain, so there's a name on it. Masculine ideology. It's a set of descriptive, prescriptive, and proscriptive of cognition about boys and men. Although there are many different, there is a particular constellation of standards that have held sway over large segments of the population, including anti-femininity, achievement, a shul of appearance of weakness and adventure, risk and violence. Man, that's what we're built for. I mean, a no, no simple, I mean... That's what we're built for. Yeah, we ought to be able to step above that, but stepping above that is something that happens as you get older, not when you're a young man. When you're a young man, you're built for violence. You're built to hunt, kill, blah, blah, blah. As you get older and these things begin to slow down, you don't quite feel that way anymore. Yeah, the, your mindset, your ideas are going to change. You can't take the standard of a man that's in his late 50s or early 60s who's still fairly fit that is comfortable, has made his achievement, and apply it to a 20-year-old and say, no, you don't need to be doing that. That's asinine. And yet we're told here that, well, that's, you know, it's a blanket statement. It'll work for everybody, and it doesn't work for everybody. Gender role conflict. Problems resulting from adherence to rigid, sexist, or restrictive gender roles learned during socialization that result in personal restriction, devaluation, or violation of others or self. The most widely studied aspect of masculine gender role strain. 
Men experience conflicts related to four domains of the menders, gender role. Success, power, and competition. Dude, if you're not trying to succeed, if you're trying to be powerful, if you're not trying to compete, you're, you're wasting time. That's an excuse to sit on the couch and be a potato. Oppression. Oppression includes the dis discrimination and or systemic denial of resources to members of groups who are identified as inferior or less deserving than others. <laughs> but that's a booby trap, isn't it? It's experienced by individuals marginalized in societies. Like if you're going to be a part of a tribe, you're going to produce. If you don't produce, why should you get more than the rest of them? Why should you get the same amount? Why should you not be grateful for what you do get if you're not producing anything to be a part of that? Privilege. Privilege refers to unearned, unearned sources of social status, power, and institutionalized advantage experienced by individuals by virtue of their culturally valued and dominant social identities. It's called the winners to the winners go the spoils of war. Tough shit, guys. That's just how it goes. I can't read it. It's just too asinine with part of this, but I do want to get to uh, a couple of things that really stick out. <laughs> In trying to understand the complex role of masculinity in the lives of diverse boys and men, it is critical to acknowledge that gender is a non-binary construct that is distinct from, although integrated to, sexual orientation. No, it's not. I don't give a shit how many letters are behind his name. That's not how it goes. I mean, you can say that. You can pretend that that's the way. You can encourage these men to do this. But the whole part of this first part of it, the rationale, is the is for the clinician to be aware of one's stereotypes and biases against boys and men's and men is a critical dimension of multicultural competence. There's the key word right there, multicultural. You know, it's got to work for everybody. And the fact of the matter is, these things do not work for people across the board. Like I said, with regards to age, the old man is going to have a different mindset than the young man, and he should. He's built that way. That's exactly what he's supposed to do. The young boy running around and bouncing off the furniture is going to have a different mindset than the man who's worked all day and come home and wants to sit on his butt for an hour. <laughs> uh, and it's going to be the same thing with different groups of individuals. The inner city youth is going to have a whole different mindset than the boy raised in the country. Right? So I can't generically apply the concepts of what it means to be a man to that uh, that old hasty kid out in the field to the inner city youth who, you know, may not work nearly as hard as that kid in the field. I can't give that same definition, and yet re really and truly, that's exactly what they're trying to do. <laughs> and to make it seem justified, they've decided to throw, well, men don't always want to be men in the mix. When's the last time you saw an example of what it means to be a man? I mean, we have plenty of heroes. We have plenty of people that go out and do great things. When's the last time you saw what it means to be a man? How, how do you understand masculinity? It comes from your group. It comes from the other men in your organization. And if they aren't, if they're not gay men in that organization, they're not going to understand it. They're not going to care. They're not going to want any part of it. And they're going to look at it with derision. If you don't like it, don't suck dick. I mean, that's just that simple. Oh, I'm sure that'll go over well. I can hear it now. People are going to be, oh, you can't say that. They're born that way. And blah, blah, blah. That's sexist. <laughs> you, just, you are that toxic masculinity. <laughs> Maybe so. But it encourages them to, to uh, expand their knowledge about diverse masculinities to help boys and men and those who have contact with them. Teachers, coaches, religious leaders, and other community figures. They want all those people to believe the same thing that they do. That may not necessarily be a good thing. They want them to become aware of how masculinity is defined in the context of their life circumstances. The goal here is to help boys and men over their lifetimes to navigate restrictive definitions of masculinity and create their own concepts. Look, in every society, in every group, in every organization, there is a, there's a standard, there's a norm, there's a normal pattern of behavior. You know, if this were to come out when I was a child, they'd be laughed. Good morning, ma'am. They'd be laughed out of countenance. 
this this whole APA report, if this would have come out when I was a child in the 70s, um, this person would have been disbarred or no, th th their credentials would have been removed. They'd have been ostracized. They'd have been made fun of because it's absolutely ridiculous. The <laughs> helping a boy navigate restrictive definition of masculinity. Um, that's that's uh, that's kind of a funny way to say, hey, we don't want these small groups of people such as tribalists, heathens, so-and-so, religious, conservative ideas uh, to hold their men to a standard. We want them to be able to get out of that standard so they might go and be probably on our side. It doesn't help anybody except them. <laughs> so what they're trying to do here is they strive to understand their own assumptions of and counter-transference reactions toward boys, men, and masculinity. So they, they proclaim they're trying to do that, and yet by the same token, they're trying to change it. But the here's the part that, that kind of gets me. The inconsistent and contradictory messages can make the identity formation process complicated for some population of boys and men. For instance, boys and men with racial or ethnic minority backgrounds, as well as those who are gay, bisexual, transgender, intellectually, psychiatrically, or physically disabled, may be the targets of various forms of prejudice and microaggressions, and often experience conflicts between dominant and minority views of masculinity. Yeah. Yeah, they will. You know, if you're in a group or a tribe or your football team and you got one boy that's, that's gay, he, he may get made fun of. That's just life. That, that's life. You know, if he doesn't, you know, <laughs> there's nothing you can do about that. Dropping the mean down so that we all become that kind of weak uh, doesn't help move any of us forward. My problem with it is, is that in that situation, you have to ask yourself, have we as a society provided that idea of what masculinity really means? I would subscribe to you that we that we haven't. That the basis of the majority of what it means to be masculine is that we denigrate others, right? That's a slippery slope, isn't it? That might really tie into this, but wait a minute. I'm supposed to be talking about masculinity. I am, and we're going to get to that. You can't build yourself into a man by constantly pointing out how much you hate this, 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 or this, right? Now, they point it out here in kind of a funny way, and they've got an ulterior motive for it. They've got the motive of making sure that, well, you're not a man. You can't really say that. You're not supposed to say that. That's been, that's been such a, a bad thing. It says boys with feminine identities or expressions may face especially negative reaction to non-formative gender expression, including emotional expressions such as passivity or crying, and experience strong pressure to demonstrate and conform to masculine expressions. That's kind of the way of things, people. And it's been that way for a long time. You know, I don't care if you want to be gay. That's that's your choice, but you're still a man. Be a man. I mean, good night. You're still going to be a man. That's all there is to it. See, re researchers demonstrate that more boys violate norms of masculinity, the more verbal and physical abuse they may face from their peers. I would suggest homeschooling. If you have a son that uh, that doesn't fit in with the rest of the boys, you know, those are usually the ones that sit at the window and watch the other boys play down the street. Their mothers are kind of overprotective of them. They're windowsill boys. They, they get to watch all the other kids play down the street, but they don't usually get to go out and participate in it because it might be too rough. They might get hurt. And see, the whole process of growing and becoming a man includes getting the shit knocked out of you every now and again. It's going to happen. Developing a thick skin, making the realization that, hey, they're making fun of me. Well, that doesn't change a single thing about you. That's part of becoming a man, not being constantly subjected to the passions of your own thought process. They said something bad about me. I'm, I'm less than, I'm, no, that's your behavior. That changed the color of your eyes, doesn't change the color of your hair, doesn't make you shorter, doesn't make you taller, doesn't make you fatter. It simply happens. Part of growing up to become a man is developing that skin that can handle that and realize it doesn't change shit about me. Say what you want. I've got some good things to do here. I'm going to go do them. 
<laughs> we're not teaching these boys that. We're giving them this excuse. We're letting these boys that sit in the house because their moms won't let them go out to play. It might be too tough. We're giving them an excuse not to develop that kind of, dare I say, stiff upper lip mentality that has allowed men to keep putting one foot in front of the other. How asinine. What kind of cancer is this to our society? <laughs> so, and then it delves off into racism, but it gets, it gets, uh, and they really take it out on white Eurocentric masculine ideals of a restrictive emotionality and self-reliance. See, the relationship between racial discrimination and, and depressive symptoms was found to be best explained by white Eurocentric masculine ideals of remote, restrictive emotionality. So, here they're saying that racial discrimination and the depression that comes from it uh, comes from white Eurocentric masculine ideals. And yet on the first page before that, they're talking about how John Henryism, which apparently is a thing where African-American males feel like they have to work harder than everybody else to prove themselves, which, shit, I'd like to see a lot more of that, honestly. <laughs> Get out there, work, prove yourself, show them what you're made out of, be a man in this world. You don't like people talking about you being black or whatever? Get out there and give it all you got. Show them who, what you're worth. We're all expected to do it. I'm expected to do it. Every single day, I'm expected to get up and go do something. You know, I have sons and daughters that are watching. Why does this person get a pass? That's not congruent with, with what it takes to build a, a, a this utopian ideal of America that we've been laboring so hard for for how many hundreds of years. We'll give that person a pass because that guy over there is an asshole. What? No. Oh. <laughs> Talking about Latino day laborers who experienced high levels of racism, but but not reported. Asian American men have a bit, have, a, have been identified that many of stereotypes depict them as feminized, weak, or otherwise unmanly. Of course, that was written by Wong, Horn, and Chin. So they give they give all these guys an out. And it just drives me insane. It, it's it's literally all over the place. And and people bought into it without even reading it. People reacted to it. All of these guys jumped around, um, got bent out of shape, didn't even read it and realize how much of a bunch of asinine nonsense is contained in this. Uh, in, in contained in this. The whole purpose of it is to help psychologists give these men and boys that come to them for therapy because they want to act differently than everyone around them an excuse to continue acting differently than the the norm of what's going on around them so if you live in a in an all-white small midwestern town and you want to come out with pink hair and earrings <laughs> the primary purpose of this report is to give that person an out an excuse a reason to continue acting in a foolish manner Nothing to say, hey, why do you feel this way? What's going on? None of that shit. No true psychological guidance. No help in understanding why, you know, they feel like they don't have a complete idea of masculinity. Just an excuse to not to try to develop and continue justifying those excesses of behavior, which, document, which are documented on our nightly news every night. All kinds of asinine bullshit. Women running around with vaginas on their head. Men running around with dildos stuck off their head. It's just ridiculous. And yet, here we have this largest professional organization of psychiatric professionals suggesting that this might be the normal thing to do, that it might be okay to give them an excuse. What a violation of the Hippocratic Oath to allow these professional educated men who are supposed to be the standards of society, the, the, uh, the uh, adventurers in, in science, the ones that help us navigate the, the troubled recesses of our own thoughts and minds, to create a document which might give them an excuse to bolster their liberal ideas and mentalities of what they think society should be and give it a blanket statement across all, all genders, roles, ages, and say, oh, it's okay, when really and truly it might not be okay. Really and truly it might be at the point where we need to say, hey, why is this person making this deviation from the norm? Is it that difficult to step up to the plate and become that? Hell yes, it's difficult. It's supposed to be difficult. It's supposed to be hard to become a man. It's supposed to be tough to become a woman. They've got to give. They've got to bear children for for crying out loud. Men have to get out and work their butts off to put some money together to pay the rent and the bills. 
It's supposed to be tough. That's what it's all about. You can watch Jordan Peterson. I don't necessarily agree with a lot of what he says. I personally think he's pretty liberal. But he said his his he keeps repeating life the the baseline condition of life is one of unbearable suffering. Well, hell yeah, it is if you're expecting somebody else to do it for you. And that's what we're trying. That's what that's what this is. This is a continuation of this idea that something or someone out there is going to take care of it, so we don't have to go through the tough times in life and become something better. Now we've got the APA saying, hey. Hey, it's okay. We'll give you an excuse. It'll be all right. You know, it's okay, sweetie. That's what grandmas are supposed to do. And you know what sucks? A lot of times you go to a grandma with some nonsense like that, she's going to slap the shit out of you, and it should be done. The, <laughs> the adherence to rigid masculinity norms for aging, gay, bisexual. Ain't that something? I get a hundred calls a day for my auto warranty I didn't know I had or paying off my student loan, which I don't have. That stuff drives me insane. Do you want me to take your phone from you? No, I'm using it. Anyway, I was going to, I get a hundred calls a day from auto dialers trying to take care of my student loans. Right. Yeah, make me a sandwich. All right. <laughs> she did it. Please. Please. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> anyway, let me get back to my, my all serious point here. Adherence to rigid masculinity norms for aging gay, bisexual, transgender, and gender nonconforming persons has been correlated with higher incidence of self-destructive behaviors. Is it too much of a stretch to suggest that those behaviors to begin with might be self-destructive? We all know the risks of it. We all know what it all looks like. <laughs> Physical and mental health problems, depression, suicide, neglecting medical needs, and fears of not being able to express their male identity due to dementia or being misgendered after death. Look, I'm telling you right now, these ideas of substance use, unprotected sex, depression, suicide, neglecting medical needs, um, those are not... Those are not the results of that behavior. That behavior may well be a result of that kind of idea. You know, it's, it's, it's a, it's, a lot of this is people are stuck in their own heads worrying about things that, <laughs> what does it matter? What does it matter? I mean, this, this adheres to rigid masculinity norms for aging, gay, bisexual, yeah, you're going to get older. You're not going to be the sexy bitch you were when you were 20. That's just how it works. And those pretty people at 48 understand that most most of all. <laughs> but the aging gay, bisexual, transgender, and not gender nonconforming person has, you know, as they get older, yeah, they're going to look back on their life and they're going to realize, man, I missed out on something. Maybe I didn't grab a hold of that challenge. And it's going to lead to that kind of thought process whereby they're a victim. They're going to find someone to blame. They're going to find anything out there because all their life they've been expecting something out there to fix what's going on in here so they can act however they want to act. See, a lot of people come into paganism with the same idea. Well, I, I can't really conform to societal norms. I've got all these other wild-ass ideas. I want to stay being a drunk or whatever. I want to hate this, that, or the other. I know what I'll do. Instead of conforming to societal norms, instead of kind of following in to become part of something greater, instead of trying to do something to become successful, uh, I'm going to find a reason to keep acting that way. And then they get older in life, like this thing suggests, and they look back on their life. They've never had to learn how to deal with things. They've never had to learn how to properly process what all this stuff really means. They've never had to develop those challenges that men go through in lives. Masculinity is not a goal. It's not... I've made the challenge, I'm a man now. No, it's going to change. As soon as you get to that point, the dynamics are going to change. As soon as you become the great warrior, you're going to attract the attention of a good woman. 
And the next thing you know, you're going to set that sword to the side. Not too far because you've got to protect your home, but now you've got to become a husband and a father and a lover. It's an entirely different set of skills than it was to be the warrior or the adventurer. And then after you have children and then they have children, now all of a sudden you're the king in your own home and you've got to provide wisdom and guidance for many people. And then after that, you know, then your kids become grandparents. And then now all of a sudden you're kind of the sage. You're you're not as relevant as you used to be. There's a transition there. And you get to that point in your life and you realize I haven't had any children. I haven't done anything. Um, I've, I've spent my life waiting on something out there to come and save me. And now I don't have the coping tools to face that great transition into this next world. I mean, all that transition, all that movement through life, we're building those tools necessary to make that transition, to make that whatever comes next. I don't know what comes next, but I know we're all going there. And it's a scary thing for a lot of people. But the fact of the matter is, it's just another transition. You can't destroy energy. You simply change it. <laughs> the tree has no idea that the life energy it, it, it utilizes to grow and create photosynthesis and turn green and shed its leaves. That at some point, if it dies, it may get cut up and that energy may turn into fire. And then heat something. They have no concept of how radically different the two energies are. But that energy is still there. It still changes. But I digress. I'm still making fun of these uh, psychologists. <coughs> but it, it, it. So now we've got through the aging part of it. But psychologists working with boys and men strive to become educated about the history and cultural practices of diverse identities to understand how these practices relate to racial, ethnic, and cultural identities, to have awareness of how masculinity is conceptualized in these groups, and to communicate this understanding and integrate it into meaningful therapeutic interactions, such as participating in cultural ceremonies and becoming integrated in their clients' respective communities. <laughs> so right there, they're suggesting that our social background, our social structure, our communities, our race is what helps define the normal standard of masculine growth. And I think it needs to be rephrased as masculine growth in each community. And then the very next column, they grow through and figure out how they can undermine that tribal aspect of becoming a man by encouraging gay men to act less fluent while attempting to understand, respect, and affirm how masculinity is defined in different cultures. Psychologists also need to avoid within-group stereotyping of individuals by helping them to distinguish what they believe to be desirable and undesirable masculine traits and to understand the reasons upon which they base these beliefs. Now, I agree with them to an extent. <laughs> You're not going to build yourself into a great man by constantly make fun of homosexuals or, or black people or Jews or... You're not going to build yourself into a man by pointing that out. You're going to build yourself into a man by figuring out that that really out there doesn't matter. That what you've got control over right here is what's right here and what's right here. And if you can handle that properly, you might be able to start influencing the world around you. See, that's the process of masculine growth that people always misrepresent. That movie Urban Cowboy, while it probably has one of the best soundtracks around, I can't stand that asshole. Urban Cowboy, the guy's walking around, he's constantly mad, he wears a hard hat, and he goes to the bar at night. No, he, the guy walks around constantly angry with a train wreck of a woman. You know, misery loves company. You know, the two sick ones are going to get together. You know, he's always angry to, to protect himself because he's going to ride a mechanical bull and there's going to be... <laughs> that whole idea of, of masculinity is, is a part of the problem. That's not real path for masculine growth. That's the boy never making any kind of transition or undergoing anything stressful to become a man, simply growing up and being an asshole. Walking around always with the facade of, well, if I'm mad enough, nobody will mess with me. I promise you, you see guys like that walking around, you walk up to them and slap the shit out of them, and nine times out of ten, they'll look at you and say, what did you do that for? I guarantee it, man, I'm telling you. Of course, you'd probably get arrested, you know, but uh, that's just the reality of it. But the entirety of this of this policy for practice and guidelines seems to be the, an undermining of, of 
of the even the cultural roles. So they've gone beyond just addressing that idea of masculinity, the urban cowboy kind of mindset, rugged, tough, union working kind of guy, and and uh, and his identity is his job. There may not be nothing else about that individual other than his job. And he will come home and sit on his ass. And, you know, by the time he retires, he's taking some medicine for hypertension, a little bit overweight. and and But he's a man, right? Well, physically, maybe. But has he ever developed those abilities to help his son become a man? Probably not. <laughs> this is where aging comes in. Because by the time he gets to that point where he's ready to retire... He can look back on his life and see all those mistakes. Now he can offer guidance to his grandson. There's a reason the reason grandkids and grandkids get along is because they have a common enemy. Hmm. So there's some interesting things there. Why would I want to handicap this man who's been through life with an outline like this that says, well, that son down there is not raising your grandson right, but you can't say anything to him about what you know because we're going to give him an excuse to go act like a retard. And I'll probably get banned for that. Hmm. But then it goes on. It continues on with the military outlook. And the military outlook is the one that gets me. So now they've gone through, you know, the social, cultural. They've denigrated the social and cultural aspect of it. They make they they say that white people have oppressed, you know, all of the African American, Latino, and uh, it has been the it has been the primary. can't find it. Dang it, man. It was really good. Although it does touch on something that I think needs to be addressed, and that's promiscuity. Traditional masculinity, masculinity ideology encourages men to adopt an approach to sexuality that emphasizes promiscuity and other aspects of risky sexual behavior, such as not learning a partner's sexual history or engaging in sex without protection from pregnancy or disease transmission. Indeed, heterosexual men's adherence to traditional sexist aspects of masculinity has been connected to sexual assault perpetration, as well as decreased condom use and increased casual hookup sex. You know, I will say that that is a problem. And it stems from Men trying to, young men, hell, even middle-aged ones, I'm ashamed to admit, attempting to figure out if they're man enough by earning that moniker from a woman. And that's a poisonous, painful lesson to learn. That no woman is going to tell you you're man enough. There's always somebody bigger, better. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Did you say please? Yes, I did. <laughs> Dude, that's awesome. For a dry subject, this is going to be awesome. Woo! Come on! Yeah! The, uh... We can't keep teaching these boys that the, the, the notch po the, the notches in your bedpost are what make you a man. Uh, and, and the problem is, is that now we're beginning to see it manifests itself among uh, young girls um, where the value of their being is centered between their legs and it's the number of men they can satisfy or whatever and it's it's really kind of a poisonous thread I mean there's some <laughs> that's a very passionate primal savage act when you get right down to it uh, you're putting some effort into it most of the time for doing it right um, that's not how we prove how we're men and yet there's a lot of people you know, and it may have stemmed from that free love mo movement where everybody could, you know, kind of enjoy their deal and someone might speak a little bit better this guy than that guy or any number of things. But it uh, it's not a real good litmus test or measurement for uh, for becoming a man. And it's and it's risky and it's dangerous. Um and it does lead to some, some bad mindsets or ideas about women. <laughs> but once again, I can say that. When you're 20 years old, 
your body is built, it's full of chemicals and hormones that work at a different level than I do at 48. Then I will at 68. Right? So I can't sit here at 48 and say, hey, uh, you know, yeah, I would prefer that they didn't. I would prefer that they would find someone that they would develop themselves into the man capable of crossing through the flames and creating an environment where a woman might express the beauty of who she is. That's not necessarily how it's going to work. Um, be that as it may, I got to set that example. I can't, I shouldn't be sitting here encouraging it. I shouldn't be sitting here saying, oh yeah, if I can get on, you can, man. You only live once. I mean, you're going to think, you, you know, I heard that stuff from my father. My father died because he ate a Viagra and butt blew up his heart in the in that final moment. My father raised me that way. And that's how you prove how much of a man you are by the number of women you've slept with. And and it literally took his life. Um that's not what I want to teach my sons. That's not what I want my sons to to think is the measure of who they are. So yeah, there that's something that needs to be addressed. I think the the traditional values of the man and woman making ceremonies, of helping women understand the value of who they are, of helping men understand the value of who they are, and that it doesn't stem from this from this act of copulation. That the better part of who they are isn't always about, you know, busting a nut somehow. <laughs> you know, there's a there was a show on for years called Lost Girl, and it was, the, and it was about a succubus, and she uh, she'd get wounded in battle or somehow, but she would. Uh, She'd have to go screw somebody to heal up, and I thought, "Wow, man, what a what a what a perverse thing to throw into the world uh, that you know you'll get your get some sexual healing." <laughs> and that's another thing too. I mean, how how hard is it for a young man who hasn't ever gone through the trials of becoming a man uh, when his girlfriend leaves him for another man when uh, she finds out he's been she's been fooling around on him. Uh, you know, it's it's hard enough to get divorced in the middle of your life and you walk around and you feel like you've got fool written across your forehead. For young people, when you're going through that and you're waiting on uh, that boy to tell you you're pretty enough or when the, when the, uh, well, your heart's pretty enough, not in your face, but when, when the boy's waiting on the girl to say, yeah, you're man enough, blah, blah. Um, and then for it not to be the truth or not to be the realization of what you expected, I mean, there's a whole other level of coping skills that need to come into play with that. And a lot of those coping skills are developed when you're a young child and you decide to engage in something that the rest of the group doesn't want to do and you make the determination that those things they're saying, they're really not changing who and what I am. You develop that skin of a man. You develop all of those wonderful things <laughs> on the masculine journey of growth. To sit there and say, put in one pot that all of masculinity is toxic is just a nice chicken shit. Psychologists can discuss with boys and men the messages they have received about withholding affection from other males to help them understand how components of traditional masculinity such as emotional stoicism, homophobia, and showing vulnerability, self-reliance, and competitiveness might deter them from forming close relationships with male peers. Some of the best, closest relationships I ever had with other men were in the service, where it was a heyday of competition and stress. Those men are brothers. They love each other, and they could give a shit what anybody thinks about them. I can promise you that much. They're, they're at a masculine level that they're not going to find themselves in a psychologist's office having difficulty showing affection. It ain't going to happen. They're going to be in a, you know, what their problem is going to be on the other side is they're going to look around at all these other men and they're going to look at, you guys ain't worth it. You're not worthy. You're not, you haven't made any of the transitions. You haven't done anything. What makes you think you can call me brother? You've been what I've been through. What do you know? Come talk to me. Oh, so you're a public servant? Yeah. Carry a rifle in the desert and then come talk to me about what it means to be a man. That's going to be the flip side of their coin. That's what they're going to be dealing with. <laughs> you know the um, the Western culture is a unique is a unique uh, setup. In India, you know, India has a greater realization of the masculine and feminine that is involved in every individual. Boys have a masculine and feminine, just like girls have a masculine and feminine. Um, in the 
you will see men walking down the street holding hands. You'll see it in Korea, too. I remember thinking, is everybody gay? And they weren't gay. They were just friends. They weren't, they weren't, uh, and it was a closer type of friendship than, than most men in Western culture would have because there was no, there was no stigma to it. You know, they were good friends and they would fight and die for each other. Um, uh, and they would walk down the street and it was the damnedest thing to see them holding hands. Um, you just can't tell, but there's a confidence involved in that. I mean, they develop, they stick with those rigid traditional roles of, uh, and values and of honor and such that help them build those those great societies over there. I've been over there a few times. I've been to Japan and Thailand and <laughs> and Korea. Those are amazing places. Um, but they don't have that hang up. And you know what else they don't have? I know they don't have they don't have near the rates of colon cancer that we have here in a Western society. They don't have near the rate of of stress-related diseases, though I think China is catching up. They're, you know, there's like a thousand new millionaires made over there every day. But the emotional stoicism, the homophobia, not showing vulnerability, um, those are the kind of things that kind of erupted out of that urban cowboy, where he's always driving around damned angry. You know, I'm going to be mad. And I think a lot of men build that up because it's kind of a wall to protect them from... <laughs> from those things that happened in their youth that they never learned how to deal with. When the little girl said, you're not good enough. And that's, that's a difficult thing, but that's growth is painful. It's not supposed to be easy. If it was easy, nobody would value it. And the slap in the face to the development of mankind are these kinds of reports that give everybody an excuse to step away from it. Can't stand it. You know, I could go on and on on this, but I think I made the point pretty clear. We can't. At some point, we as a society need to be taking a look at that and saying, hey, if you're going to serve us as professionals, if you're going to be a part of the community, if you're going to get educated and expect uh, for us to trade our dollars for your time to help us through this path of growth, you're going to have to live up to the standards and quit giving everybody uh, an excuse when I'm trying to move forward in a positive way. You know, this kind of nonsense, the failures of monotheistic church, you have to realize those kind of two things, those supports, the, the medical community, the, the spiritual community, the government, they're all kind of self-imploding with marginal ideas to make everyone feel important. And in the middle of all that that's happening, You've got these great pagan, heathen, also true ideas emerging, and all of a sudden, they're becoming the ones. How did that reversal happen? When these, what, 30 years ago were considered devil worshippers down the street, we better call DHS, I want to make sure them kids are okay. Um, how did they all of a sudden, we all of a sudden become the standard for the traditional values and roles that built our societies. You have to ask yourself what kind of changes are really afoot for that to be happening. I appreciate you guys joining me today. I hope you had a good laugh on that. that look, because you ain't going to believe this shit. Oh, I got a sandwich. Yeah, baby. <laughs>